Hello and welcome to the fourth and final conversation in our series on how to have a healthy relationship with money. Coming to you, as always, live from the studios of Charles Stanley in central London. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing how to achieve financial well-being with a focus on prevention being better than cure. As always, we'd love you to join in the conversation with us. After all, we're here for you today. So uh, do send any thoughts questions, wisdom or experiences you'd like to share with us or get answers to, uh, you can send them our way via the chat box which you'll see on your screen and I'll weave some of your thoughts into our conversation here and uh, we'll be answering your questions as well. We've got plenty of time to do that. Uh, here today to share their wisdom and experience are Iona Bain, financial journalist and author of Spare Change and Own It. Iona was diagnosed with the numbers form of dyslexia, dyscalculia, at school and remembers crying through maths and being bottom of the class. Sorry about that, it's happened <laughs> to a lot of us. She says, though, if she can master financial matters, anyone can. And also with us, Lewis Koch, Senior Investment Manager at Charles Stanley, advising families, founders and CEOs, amongst others, to build, preserve and enjoy their wealth over the long term. Welcome to both of you. It's great to have you. Uh, so I want to start then by picking up on research that's been carried out by Charles Stanley, which found that six out of ten people who responded to a survey commissioned by Charles Stanley said that they're worried about their financial futures, and one in five of them are extremely worried, um, with women clearly showing up as being more worried than men. And bear in mind, this research was carried out amongst high net worth individuals, in other words, people with more than £500,000 worth of investable assets. So it's, it's clear it's people across the board who are worrying about their financial situation. Uh, so Lewis, I thought we'll start with you then. What, what are the sorts of worries that you're encountering with the people that you're working with? So it can be really specific to, to either a person or a family, but there's mm -hmm. certainly some trends in, in what you see, some commonalities. Um, and for me, there are kind of three that, that come up quite regularly. So first of all is care, is when you reach the latter stages of life, are you going to need care and how do you pay for that? Um, the second is retirement, so pre-care, how do you fund your retirement? We're moving away from the, the age of final salary pension schemes, mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Uh, and then finally is it, attention turns to the next generation. You've got high housing costs, you've got student loans and, and debt associated with that, how do you pass on wealth to your children and, and not just the, the money but also the guiding principles of how to, to deal with that and how to, to prosper. Um, that's certainly the, the top three themes that I see. And, and Iona, what about the things you're encountering with the people you work with? I think firstly the high cost of living is affecting everybody yeah. and if you combine that with rising taxes then even if you are further up the income scale you can find an awful lot of your income being swallowed up very quickly by taxes mm -hmm. and basic costs as well mm -hmm. so we're not necessarily talking about lots of excess spending on luxuries it's just paying for the basics right across the board is proving more difficult at the moment plus uncertainty is extremely difficult to cope with I think since the financial crash we did have an environment in which there were some stable factors such as low interest rates, low costs of borrowing, um, relatively low inflation and that lasted for quite a long period of time. That era is now over and, and we face a much more uncertain outlook which is really unnerving for people. Mm -hmm. And I think we still have a, a culture and a society that encourages high standards that's based on you know, consumerism. And I saw a really interesting quote from an expert in perfectionism the other day who was talking about um, how that can really feed into people's anxieties to maintain high standards but sometimes to the cost of their um, mental well-being. Being, and this quote really stuck with me. He said, every last one of us in the West lives inside a culture knitted by perfectionist fantasies. And I just thought that really nicely summed up the kind of continual pressure we all face to try and be more and do more and how that can you know, rub up against this very difficult reality of rising living and borrowing costs. Yeah, I mean, keeping up the jo with the Joneses is nothing new, but it kind of takes a new level when mm. you've got social media and you're seeing the apparently beautiful lifestyles of, of everybody around you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you spoke about um, you know, the, the financial anxieties that people are experiencing right now, but how that can be particularly acute 
among women. Yeah. And I think possibly that's because women do feel more of that pressure to try to maintain those high standards in the home, within their family, um, perhaps within the community as well. And that can be very difficult against the backdrop of this uh, economic environment that we're living in at the moment. So you've both identified then, I mean, you know, the, the areas that people are all too well aware of, lots and lots of pressures. So how do you start to unpick that, Lewis? I wonder if you could sort of perhaps give us some, some examples of, of where you, you start to go with someone who comes into you and says, I, I'm struggling, I've got finite resources and they're being stretched everywhere I look. Yeah. So first of all, it tends to be a, a bit of a sort of download of, of what is it that's worrying you. Talk to about your, your financial life. Mm -hmm. um, and inevitably, you've got a sort of core of, of a few major issues. And then there's all this sort of peripheral um, piece around it. So actually, what we tend to a lot of do a lot of the time is simplifying and mm -hmm. just getting to those core um, and, and getting people on the right direction of travel. I mean, the, the perfectionist point is exactly valid um, in that often people want the perfect plan. They want an exact knowledge of what's going to happen and when, and that is just not realistic. Certainly in the, in the world that we're in now, um, you don't have that kind of visibility. But what you can do is simplify and get the direction of travel right, and then gradually finesse and finesse and finesse as you go through. Mm -hmm. And that can be greatly sort of uplifting um, mm -hmm. to people because it gives you something, a tangible plan. Mm -hmm. may not be perfect, but the direction of travel is right, and that will get you mm -hmm. most of the way there. Mm -hmm. So peeling away what you, you know, we're talking about focusing on what you do need to worry about, but when you start to think about that, you start to bring in ever more things, and it can become quite overwhelming mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And when Lewis was talking before about the core concerns that people might have, for instance, care costs, that's a very valid worry because, mm -hmm. you know, we are going to get older, we may end up needing that care or our parents may need that care. And we want to ensure, of course, that, that our parents, our family gets the best possible care. That is a valid priority to, to work towards. It's about identifying those valid priorities and, and those that are not as important. And, and it is difficult when you have been immersed in that kind of lifestyle and that culture and that world where everything can take on almost equal importance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that drawing up your list of values and what matters to you and then comparing that with what you're liable to get dragged into and sucked into in your everyday life and the kinds of superficial things that you may be tempted to prioritize instead. Not because that's your inherent instinct, but because that's what the culture around you encourages you to do. Really making that distinction in your mind is so important at a time like this. And I think even after lockdown, if we hadn't had this difficult economic environment, I think it, it still definitely is a an opportunity for people to really reevaluate what they do with their lives and what really matters to them mm -hmm. and often that can lead to really important epiphanies around how you spend your money mm -hmm. and, and how you therefore build that financial resilience are you noticing an increase in, in the number of people who are worrying about this because there are just so many factors coming in. I mean, obviously, there's, there's always going to be a steady stream of people who are wanting to take ownership and a, a, a body of people also who have a fairly healthy attitude to their money in terms of, well, it, it's OK, I don't need to worry too much. Is, is that is the dynamic changing? It is. And, and that's a function of a few things, really. One, that the world that we live in now, you know, up until 2019, um, as Ona said, we had fairly low interest rates, a fairly benign investing environment. Yeah. Now we have a lot of change to deal with, but we also have an aging population. Um, and we, we were talking before about there is a certain sort of cohort and age group in, in the UK at least, um, where you can have this, this um, phenomenon of double dependence, where you've got people trying to care and potentially fund for parents and also children at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and if th that can be something of a, a kind of a, a tricky thing for people to deal with, they can't see an obvious way out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that we find quite a bit. There's a whole journey that to go on as to, as to where are you now? What are your concerns? And, and actually the full scope of what you can do 
in that situation. Especially if you don't necessarily have a culture within your family of talking openly about money. Absolutely. Um, and I think it must be very difficult when you get to, say, middle age and you have elderly parents who don't really want to confront difficult decisions that they might have to make around downsizing and things like that. And likewise with your children, bringing them up in the world today where they're having to really grapple with digital money and the fact that that doesn't feel the same as, as real physical money that we all yeah. grew up with. Yes. Um, you know, how do you educate them to spend their money in a responsible way and also encourage your, your parents or other people in your family to, to think about the future, to think about things that will happen, such as yeah. ageing and dying. Difficult subjects that all of us mm. have a discomfort around. Mm. You know, we, we talked about it in previous webinars, how do we open up those conversations within families so, so it just becomes easier to, to be able to bring up those difficult things. And you said if, you, if you're in a, an environment where people aren't comfortable with talking about money, I, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that's the majority of people out mm. there, is it? What, what's your sense of, of that? It is exactly that, yeah. And, and sometimes it's just a taboo topic, you just, it just doesn't come up. Sometimes it's a control thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that quite a lot where the older generation are used to being in control. Um, there comes a point where actually the younger ones might want to, to take control of how, how things are dealt with and how this double dependence um, equation is solved. Um, and that's something that you just need to chip away at. But it can really be beneficial sometimes to have a sort of neutral third party. Yeah. You know, every family, like every company, has some politics and, and mm -hmm. uh, relationships within it. Mm -hmm. um, but having that neutral ground just to have an open, honest conversation, once it's done, can be greatly uh, enhancing. But actually getting there is a, everything is unique, but just a chipping away exercise. Yeah. And, and you just got me thinking as well, Iona, when you said about that thing of how younger generation are managing their money differently because of new financial tools, new ways of banking, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that sort of responsibility as a parent also to try to educate your child mm. into having good, a good healthy relationship with money. But if you don't necessarily have that or you don't necessarily have the tools to do that, that can also be a daunting thing in itself mm -hmm. when you're grappling with your own issues. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's easier said than done um, to be the best possible role model for your children mm -hmm. and to show them that you're not afraid of, of talking about and dealing with your money. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, if, if you can try to show your children that you have a positive, constructive approach to money, mm -hmm. that, that you, um, you may have your anxieties or your worries about it, but then you quickly move to the next stage, which is to come up with a plan. However imperfect that plan is, my mum always says to me, you know, always have a plan, even if it's not a particularly good one. You can then change it, you can modify it, you know, as Lewis was saying before. Not having all the answers is absolutely fine. And helping young people understand that actually when they leave school, it is impossible to know everything there is to know about the world of money because the world of money will keep changing and evolving. Mm. I'm still learning about money. I don't consider myself actually to be an expert. You know, people might say that about me, but I'm not very comfortable with that term because I feel that it's a lifelong process, understanding your own money and then trying to get to grips with the changing economy. But so long as you are fostering that curiosity and that willingness to engage with the world of money and come up with those positive, constructive solutions, I think you're then setting your children up for, for a much better future. Can we go back to what you were saying, Lewis, about the people who are finding themselves in that situation of kind of looking in both directions and seeing pressure? Children, mm -hmm. school fees potentially, cost of raising those children, and then the care costs of, of the parents. Um, that puts a, a huge burden on someone and the sort of levels of income that you would need to, to manage that, you know, it's like, it's, it's sort of um, obviously probably higher than, than people might imagine. So I wondered if you might, if you've got some examples to talk through, you know, obviously completely anonymized, <laughs> but sort of uh, just to give us a sense of, of where people are, are finding the pressure even high up the income level. Yeah, so, so one particular um, client comes to mind and, and this is an individual that, that fits that, that bill. So yeah. high earner, in theory you would think that there is nothing to worry about for this person, um, but when you factor in say three children at school, a school that needs to be paid for, um, and the, the parental care, 
all of a sudden you come down to a very, very small figure, um, especially what Iona was saying about tax as well, mm. that can make a significant dent. Mm. Um, so ha quite often the benefit of talking to, to people or professional about this is you can sort of get lost in your own head sometimes where you can't see any way out. This is mm. just a defined outcome. And that's where, where this person was. But actually there are options. So in, in the one case that I'm thinking of, um, there are things you can do in terms of investments you choose that have some sort of tax relief associated with them. Mm -hmm. So you can reduce that tax burden somewhat. That also is invested capital. So that gives some capital that should be available f for use later in life. The other thing you can do um, is look at inheritance tax planning. So mm -hmm. actually this one individual was trying to pay all these school fees out of his, his earned income. Well, if you've got parents that are open to the idea and have an inheritance tax problem or a potential inheritance tax problem, is there some route there where perhaps a bit of sensible planning, perhaps they could then fund the school fees um, and then some sort of adjustment is made in, in the estate. And then the final thing was with that particular client, his earnings were performance related. Mm -hmm. So we looked and said, well, if the tax is kind of what it is to, to a certain degree, the school fees, we can hopefully do something about that. The other variable is your income. So can we introduce you to a, a coach or other services that can essentially make you better and increase your top line? So whereas you had no, no gap in terms of income versus expenditure, actually we, we need some, some air there mm. to be able to then do some, some proper planning. So even situations where you think, well, this just is a foregone conclusion, mm -hmm. it's not always the case. Actually, with a bit of, of innovative planning uh, and being open-minded, you can really achieve quite a lot. That bringing in a coach to sort of help someone to uh, get a bit of breathing space and think yes. about how they might change their circumstances is obviously you know, a very helpful thing when someone's feeling like they're on a treadmill and they're under huge pressure. Um, in terms of actually materially changing a financial situation, in these circumstances of ever-increasing costs. Is, is that almost the only way people can do it, Iona? Cutting outgoings can't really keep pace with the, with the um, increase in cost of living. It's extremely difficult to generalise across the board because I think in my experience of writing and talking about young personal finance over the past 11, 12 years, I've found that young people have for some time really struggle to conceive of a way to both manage their lives today and to enjoy themselves and of course to plan for the future as well. So a lot of my my job has been about trying to think of, of ways to, to do all three but accepting that it's got to be about the art of the doable. This is a kind of mm -hmm. motto that I have within my, yeah. my finances which is you know perhaps you are not going to be able to achieve all your goals or your dreams, perhaps you're not going to be able to achieve that balance perfectly. Um, but maybe there are little hacks and tricks that you can deploy. I think a good example of this is pensions. Um, I think lots of people feel very daunted by the pension savings targets that are often quoted today. This idea that if you're, for instance, age 30, you should be saving 15% of your income into mm -hmm. a pension. That sounds like an awful lot mm -hmm. of money. Mm -hmm. What I'd say is if you can look at things like contribution matching, if your employer is willing to put a little bit more into your pension, if you put more in, then that will really maximise the pot. Anytime you get you know, a pay rise, anything like that, making sure that goes into your pension, it may seem like a sacrifice, but actually over time, because of compound interest, because of time in the stock market, because of all those factors, and now, of course, with taxes going up, the sheer tax efficiency that is offered by pensions for those who are in those higher tax brackets, um, it can actually end up being a win-win situation where you are able to, to bring down your, your take-home earnings, um, you know, which is beneficial in, in lots of ways, but then also mm -hmm. have a, um, a, a proper savings pot for the future um, because that is undoubtedly an issue that the younger generations are going to have to grapple with. Um, so I think I used to be a bit more sceptical or cynical about pensions than, than I am now because I now realise that being, coming into those higher um, tax brackets myself, I think to myself, actually, this is, this is quite a smart solution to a lot of different yeah. problems that I could have otherwise. And as Lewis said, if you don't, if you don't necessarily know that, then you're just going to see problems and, and you're not going to be able to see the solutions. Mm -hmm. 
I think there's another side to that, which is the generational aspect. So previous generations have had, or some, have had the, the advantage of defined um, pension schemes, yes. mm -hmm. you know, final salary schemes. Mm -hmm. And what's happened as the years have gone on is this enormous sort of risk transfer from, from employers and insurance companies to individuals. And some have realised, but I think a lot haven't. Mm -hmm. And it's that habitual, you've got to make this decision yourself yes. to put in for pensions or any other vehicle, but long-term savings. Um, because it's an enormous pot of money potentially mm -hmm. that people will need when they come to retirement, uh, and it's that's now down to the individual, not a, a sort of insurance company or, or employer. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, are people just thinking, I I'm never going to be able to retire? I'm not even thinking that way. Yes, that's a very common view that I come across among younger people. This idea that we're not even going to have a state pension one day, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where that that view comes from because it's. It's not one that I share. I, I do think that we will have a state pension, but I do think that we shouldn't rely on it. And, and as Lewis said, times have changed. So people are having to take greater responsibility for their retirement in that way. But I, I do think that, especially if you are in those higher tax brackets, um, there are definitely opportunities there with your pension to be able to be both tax efficient in the here and now and also build up that fund for the future. So before we um, dig a bit deeper into the, the practical and the specifics and what people can do, I just wanted to go back to that art of the doable mm -hmm. um, and identifying where there might be some capacity in income and outgoings that people aren't spotting. I guess there's some psychology around that as well. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, the, 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 the skill of, of my job is, is to try to convey, you know, what is possible and what is doable whilst being sensitive a, a, around um, issues to do with your situation, your job, your, your housing that, that may not be, um, you may not be able to change um, in, in the short term or even in the long term. So I think knowledge is power. The more knowledge and understanding that you have about what's going on with your finances, the more you'll be able to cope with uncertainty, which is just a, a, a fact of life now and is something we're all going to have to, to, to deal with. So establishing the facts around your mortgage renewal, your credit card balance, your savings interest, your investment portfolio, how much is in your pension, when your various insurance policies are coming up for renewal. Having that understanding and knowledge can feel daunting and it can feel as if you're going to confront a lot of a lot of nasty information actually that you'd prefer to maybe you know keep at bay but but it is far better to, to understand what's going on and you may be pleasantly surprised things may not be as bad as they seem I'm not saying they may be fantastic but they may not be as bad as they seem and then I think thinking about the urgent goals so you can get to the important goals so I think that there's always that balance in life between dealing with the urgent and not neglecting the important I think that if you, for instance, have large debts, you, you cannot you know, ignore those and, and continue to save the absolute maximum you can into your savings or your pension. You have to deal with those debts. If you have an expensive mortgage, for instance, you can't pretend that's not an issue. I'm in that situation right now where I took out a fixed rate mortgage when interest rates were low. It's coming up for renewal this year. The rate is going to go up massively. I've anticipated that problem ahead of time and in my view it will be best if in the short term I prioritise paying down that mortgage as much as I can. So using any spare cash that I have to try to pay that mortgage down and even if it means going on to a standard variable rate for a period, on the surface that might seem like quite a bad decision because it's a very high rate but because I'm reducing the amount of debt that I owe that could actually be better than me just kind of keeping that mortgage ticking over in the long run and you know having that mortgage debt there with me um, you know for many more years than is necessary so that's a decision yeah. that I've made at this moment in time yeah. um, to try and deal with that problem but as soon as my mortgage is back to a more manageable place I'm going to be ramping up my savings and investments okay. again so you know sometimes as I said before it's not possible to achieve that perfect balance at all times maybe some things will need your attention more than others but don't forget about the long term and don't forget about mm. the future because it's going to happen. Those sorts of choices Lewis do require savviness and if you don't have it yourself obviously getting that advice on that from someone else who, who can look at the, the sums Exactly. I mean, I said to a client only recently, actually, the decisions that you make in a 5% interest rate world are very different to a 1% world. Yeah. Um, that whole where money goes or capital allocation is what, what we call it in industry parlance. Um, that's a real key decision. And that's if you're, if you're fortunate enough to have an advisor that helps you, mm -hmm. they should be prompting you to do that. 
Um, but if you're doing things yourself, then that is a great example of financial education can go a really long way. You know, the compounding effect of, of higher mortgages for a sustained period of time can be really financially destructive. I mean, the, the worst possible combination would be your debt costs are going up and you've chosen bad investments, so you've got neither of both things working for you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So let's um, talk then in practical terms about how to get on top of things, uh, how you plan, particularly when there are so many unknowns as we've been talking about and so much uncertainty. Um, I, I like a good quote. Here's a good one from, from Baz Luhrmann's The Sunscreen Song. Uh, the real troubles in your life are apt to be the things that never crossed your worried mind, the kind that blindside you at 4 p.m. on some idle Tuesday. Mm. And I know, Iona, I mentioned a little bit about your your backstory, your issues with numeracy. There was a moment I know in your life that, that made you change path yes. and, and is what's taken you down this very numerate <laughs> path. So can, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so when I was in my early 20s, I was actually a musician and I was working as a pianist at a bar in Glasgow and I was getting all my earnings cash in hand and putting them in a piggy bank and keeping that piggy bank at my parents' house where I lived at the time and I thought I was being really smart and grown up doing this and then uh, we came back because my parents came to watch me in one of these gigs came back to the house one night and it turned out that the house had been burgled mm -hmm. so I went up to my bedroom and of course the piggy bank was not there because the burglar must have thought all these Christmases had come at once and I just remember having to give a description of the piggy bank to a police officer later that night and thinking this is ridiculous I'm 23 years old and you know that's about 500 600 pounds worth of my money's just gone like that yeah. um, and I kind of learned obviously that if I've got that money and it really means a lot you know probably keeping it in a piggy bank in my house is not the best idea putting it in the bank is better and then learning about actually how inflation was eroding the value of that cash was fascinating because it's such an abstract concept that it can be quite difficult to get your head drained at first but then when you grasp it you realize that actually that that's you losing money in real terms and so I became fascinated with the idea of well what can I do to conserve my cash and then grow it especially because of the challenging economic environment at that time for millennial graduates like me so that's when I started my blog Young Money and I think since then I've realized that actual, actually financial well-being is, is not about wealth, it's about resilience. Mm -hmm. It's about having options and knowing that if certain things go wrong, including those things that could blindside you on a Tuesday, that you could never have anticipated, that you do have options, that you do have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. And that's why I can sleep relatively well at night because I know that even if I don't have the most luxurious lifestyle, I know I have options if, if interest rates were to go up to a level that I couldn't afford. I know that I would be able to manage in retirement because you know I've got different plans for, for that period of my life. So, for me, that's, that's what the last 10 years have been about, learning how to be resilient in a world where, you know, that, that's, that's absolutely essential. Having peace of mind. Absolutely. So, uh, Lewis, the steps then to start out when someone's at that point where they've effectively lost the piggy bank or whatever it is, or they're feeling like they're not able to sleep at night because they're worried. How, how do you break it down? So I think it, it comes back to that simplicity point. Sometimes people can, it, it, it's difficult to know where to start. You've got so many different competing interests. Mm -hmm. So simplicity, prioritise is another one. Um, and there's a, a sort of psychological trick that I, I use quite a bit, which is compartmentalising. Mm -hmm. So if you want a pot for a certain event that's going to happen in your life or a, a liability, school fees, for example, that's going to occur, have a dedicated pot for that purpose. And when you aggregate that all up, actually it may all sort of come out in the wash, but from a point of view of planning, mm -hmm. it can be incredibly useful to say, right, so if I'm worried about school fees or nursery fees or debt repayment, wherever it may be, that's done. I know that's that pot, so I can park that worry. Mm -hmm. um, can be very, very useful. Mm -hmm. The you other thing- Something tangible that you can start building from. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, the other aspect that sometimes people forget about is they think about investments and they think about savings and debt, but it depends what the risks are you're worried about. But insurance is another one. Um, yeah, we often do find that if people are worried about losing their job, if you're the primary breadwinner and you're at the peak of mortgage and kid fees and costs and so on and so on, um, 
is that an insurable risk? Is there something you can do there? Um, that might be a very good solution and one that doesn't require enormous financial sacrifice, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of looking at things in the round, but starting with a simple plan um, to really distill down what is it I'm, my major worries are, that's where you can then form a base and start to plan from there. And, and when you're young, insurance is relatively cheap. Yes. Um, you know, when it comes to saving into your pension, if you start young, you give yourself an enormous head start in the stock market and with compound interest, and you can afford to take that little bit more risk with your pension fund. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you start making these decisions when you're young, then you gain a lot of advantages there. And, and, and the difficult thing is understanding how you can fit that into your life at a time when those things don't seem like they're the priority. Um, but, but if you can just try and make space for those things in the long term, you'll be really glad of it. So, I mean, as you say, head start if you're young. I want to bring in a question from the audience. Uh, my partner and I are in our 40s and looking to get our finances in more order to be better prepared. What are the top items we should prioritise? Mm -hmm. Shall I start yeah, with that? Okay, so first thing is to prioritise is take a, a good audit of what you have now. Okay. Um, Anything, what, what tends to come out in that process is things which are unnecessary. So this is probably a pretty good time to just jettison any kind of financial spending that is not, um, is not kind of worthwhile. Uh, secondly, we'll be looking at things like savings and debts and the cost of those. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to repay them, as Iona's saying, or let them run? Um, and then I would say the third comes on to what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What's important to you? Um, and then you can really start to, to plan. But you've got to start with the sort of data around where you are now as your, your start. That's your foundation. Mm -hmm. And also reviewing the, the way that you manage your finances. Is it really working for you? Because there has been a huge sea change with, with technology over the past 10 years. And now there are so many more tools available that personally have been a real game changer for me in terms of my finances. You know, Lewis was talking before about compartmentalizing your finances. So much easier to do that now with technology. Yeah. Um, you can have separate accounts for so many different aspects of your finances and move money between them with a, a lot more ease than was previously the case. And you can also make saving and investing the default with your finances um, in a way that wasn't possible. In the past, you would have to make the the active decision over and over again to save and invest for the future, which we know is a difficult decision to make because there's lots of things that could compete for that money in the here and now. But if, for instance, you have an automatic um, standing order to put X amount into your savings and your investments per month and that happens without you even having to think about it, mm -hmm. that's a really good example of using technology to, to, to take care of something that could otherwise get put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. It also reminds me of that perfect point in that one, if you've got to make a conscious decision to invest some yeah. money, there's always a reason not to do it. So, oh, there's an election coming up or there's, I don't know, something kicking off somewhere. Yeah. Well, that removes that conscious decision. So there's a, a process called pound cost averaging, which can be incredibly useful if you're gradually investing. Um, the danger with that is that if you actually have to do something and click a button to, for that process to work, the temptation is you won't. You'll just wait for things will be better next month, yeah. next year. Yeah. Well, they might be, but it will be reflected in, in the price. You know, that automation can really work wonders for compounding. OK. Someone has uh, come in with a p question responding directly to what you were saying about resilience, Iona. I understand resilience is a desirable attribute, but how do you balance that against an anxiety that you simply don't know what the future holds? It's all very well to talk about having plans A, B, C, D, but what exactly would those be? Uh, yeah, I, I, as I said before, it does completely depend on your situation. Um, I guess, you know, to take my particular um, circumstances, you know, when I bought my house, um, I was going into a period of time where I had a feeling that interest rates would rise at some point, um, simply because we were starting to see inflation coming up on the horizon. And, you know, we know that central banks do tend to respond to inflation by raising interest rates. So that, that's a scenario where it wasn't guaranteed to happen, but there was a bit of a playbook there and there was a, an outcome that could be somewhat anticipated. Um, and I think that if you kind of stay plugged in enough to this world and, and get on top of these things for long enough, you can start to see those things ahead of time. And for me, that didn't stop me buying my flat, but it did make me think, okay, probably I shouldn't 
by that place there where I would really be overreaching, really overborrowing and really overstretching myself if interest rates were to go up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to make a bit of a trade off here and get that place instead, which is not as desirable, not somewhere where in an ideal world I would want to live. But over the long run, I still had very good reasons to do it for you know, personal and professional reasons. Um, so, so that was an example of me kind of not, not being paralyzed by indecision, uncertainty, fear about what the future might hold, but, but building in that little bit of resilience there just in case things did pan out in that, in that way. And, and they did, and I'm very glad that I made that choice now. Mm. Yeah, and you were, as you say, looking at the trends. So yes. that's kind of the advice to people to, to, to engage with with what we're seeing happening around us and trying to spot where it might be going. Yes, and I think it, it is about having a, a healthy dose of, of scepticism and cynicism as well around what official predictions might be. Um, for instance, at that time, I think the Bank of England was, was quite kind of relaxed about inflation, was quite relaxed about um, that whole trend. And, and I think that, you know, if, if you take people at their word sometimes on those things, then, then you yourself could end up being a bit complacent. But I felt, mm, I'm just not going to quite take them at their word there. You things... outsmarted the Bank of England. No, no, <laughs> no, it's not so much that. It's more that I guess when you've kind of been around for long enough, you start to realise that things don't, don't turn out exactly as it's, as it's expected by, you know, those in power, you know, those who are in charge and, you know, kind of anticipating that there might be an alternative outcome could stand yeah. you in good stead. Yeah. And we've seen that. We've seen yeah. that with the, the financial crisis of 2008. Yes. And how that wasn't foreseen in the predictions. Yes. So it's always, yeah. And sometimes you learn from, from your past mistakes as well and, and things that you actually, you know, took, you might have believed certain things in the past and realised actually in the future I'm going to be a little bit more hard headed. Uh huh. True. Um, so a question that I want to put to you, Lewis, my finances would be my number one stress. Is there a checklist that I could work to that would help me know that I have everything under control? You were talking about the sort of almost the blank page of getting everything down, but a, che a checklist is a good way to remember what you don't think a, of. A checklist is, is fantastic. The only downside with it is that everyone is unique. So having one universal, the list would have to be so long. Um, I'm not entirely sure that would, that would be great, but so I, I get the, the intention. So what I tend to do with, um, with clients on a similar line is look at where you are now, where you want to go, and how big is that gap? You know, how far away are you? Um, and then I look at things, again, I come back to the simple point. So I tend to divide someone's financial life into a quadrant. Mm -hmm. So income, expenses, assets, and liabilities. Mm -hmm. And if you then couple where you want to go with your pure financial where you are now, this quadrant doesn't have to be overly complicated, then you can start to see, well, this is this is a gap. You know, my income um, is not large enough for me to then start investing. I want to have a pension or a comfortable mm -hmm. retirement. So what do I do? But it highlights the where you might need be deficient and where you might need to, to do something about. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be very, very useful. I mean, in what's being discussed here, you, you can sort of end up in a position, it seems, where there is no money left over mm -hmm. for, for nice things, because yeah. being so practical, yeah. how do you decide when you can actually just ease off and spend money on nice things? How much should we allow ourselves to spend on the, the, the niceties? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, part of my, my um, strategy has been to have a, a healthy amount in easy access savings so that um, I, I, there's a great quote from Jane Austen which is um, once money is parted with it can never return and for me that really encapsulates the issue with spending which is that once that money is gone that's it you're never going to get it back hopefully it went on something you really loved and and you enjoyed but if it didn't well you know you, you have to live with that yeah. but with saving it's it's an act of self-care in as opposed to it being an act of sacrifice because that money is still yours it's just being put on one side and hopefully built up so you can do more with it in the future and and I guess if, you know for me it's about deciding do, do I want to have this this smaller thing now or do I want to have that bigger thing further down the line that I know I'll really love and cherish and appreciate um, but having that money then in easy access savings gives me the option to, to get hold of that money when I want to so yeah maybe having a healthy amount there so that if you want to, to spend it then then you can do and there is no penalty as opposed to putting it in your pension which that should only be money that you know that you can afford to put away for your retirement. 
I would just add on, there's a quote that springs to mind. And I I'm think, loving the quote. Yeah, we're on a roll. <laughs> yeah. I think it's from Jim Rohn, and, and it yeah. says that most people spend their income and invest what's left. Yeah. And what wealthy people do is they invest what they want first, and then they spend mm -hmm. what's left. And it's a massively important distinction. So what can help in, in this kind of what do I, you could be a great investor in terms of the money you're putting away, but you're not enjoying your life. So what's, what's the point in this? Mm -hmm. So there can be quite a good benefit in habitually investing or saving, and every now and again, just give yourself a pass and say, actually for this month, we're gonna do something fun, something yeah. interesting. But because you've got that habitual nature, then that you will tend to put away more than you spend just by design. That's just how it tends to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it comes back to the automation thing. If you're automatically saving or investing, the conscious decision is to depart from that and just have a bit of spontaneous fun. Um, not, oh, I'm kind of bored this month, maybe I'll invest or save. That's, yeah. it's okay, but you're never, you're very, very unlikely to get to where you want to be financially if you do it that way around. So if you never go to the gym and you go a couple of times, it won't make any difference. Exactly. But if you go all the time and yeah. you take a couple of times off, yeah, give yourself it won't a pass. You. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, a, a question I, I you you may may or may not like this, um, Lewis. Given the stretch on all our personal finances, why would we pay high fees for investment managers? Are they worth it, or would we be better advised to invest in a robo manager? It's a very valid point. So, <laughs> very valid point. So what I would say is, is there are there's two ways of looking at this. Access to investment markets is commoditized and is fairly cheap. So yes, I agree on the fees point. If if I'm going to buy the same UK listed PLC that a robo advisor is going to pay, well, you would just pay the cheapest possible rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the the benefit is not so much in buying X, Y, and Z given share. It's in the the advice that comes with it. So it's all of this, like we were talking about the the client with the tax planning and the coaching and. The, the accountability that regular meetings would bring, all of that, suddenly, is that worth more than 1% per year? Yes, demonstrably, because the, the, that client has increased their income, decreased their tax, they've got a much happier, um, financially healthier life at the end of it, so the reward they get is a multiple of the fees. Mm. There are times when your yeah, markets are poor and clients will justifiably look and say, well, am I getting the best value for money? Um, but I would just reiterate is that point around the service you get and the investment performance. It's not just um, you know, buying shares of A, B and C, one broker versus another. So potentially if you're very savvy, then you can do it the, 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 the sort of the robo way. Yeah. Um, but if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what's out there, then exactly. the if, advice might pay off. Yeah, if you take a very keen interest in tax rules, investments, some people do, some, some love it, it becomes like a sort of hobby that then evolves as they retire and becomes kind of their full-time job. Great, that's, that's you know, power to them. We're in the internet age, the information age. Yeah. Um, for a lot of clients, actually, they don't want to do that. They want um, somebody to be that sort of guiding principle um, and there's also a great benefit in if I see 50 clients then there is probably more than one set of, of, of common problems um, so I can then say ah oh, actually I've had a client where we've done this we've done that we've done that you're getting the benefit of me seeing the same issues coming up over and over mm. um, whereas you're googling them for the first time mm. so there can be a great benefit in that mm. and I don't have any skin in the game here mm. I say to younger people you know when your your finances are more basic then you can absolutely get your head around what you need to do it's not to say that in in its own way that's not complicated figuring out what your values are how to balance you know managing life enjoying life and preparing for tomorrow but you can do that yourself as your finances get more complicated as you move up the tax brackets many more considerations come into play particularly around tax and that's when I think technical expertise is absolutely invaluable and I always say to people especially when they're approaching retirement those decisions especially ones that may end up being irreversible are not ones you want to take completely on your own and even having you know a third party there who has got that technical expertise can just be so so helpful. What about advice that is out there online? There's a lot of social media influencers putting stuff out there. Is, is that 
good in your experience? I'm guessing there's quite a mix of, of what's out there. There is a real mix. I think that overall it's a very positive development that we have more people willing to talk about their finances, what they've learned, and hopefully giving people a much better steer, particularly at a younger age, because young people leaving school now are, are being confronted with this incredibly complex consumer economy with all these different decisions that they have to make um, and having you know influences there to really help people get back to basics mm -hmm. there's, there's there's something really really positive about that i think the one of the problems is as lewis was saying you don't know what you don't know and maybe you know you might have some invaluable expertise to offer on how to get out of debt but that doesn't mean that you therefore really have that understanding about investing. And sometimes you might have influences straying from, from that particular area into that area. And that's when maybe the information you're getting is not going to be as reliable. And then there's always, you know, the question of whether they're being incentivized to, to say certain things that may be in their own interests, but not in your interests mm -hmm. as the consumer of that information. And I think that at least if you're getting advice, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty transparent transactional but that that person there is working for you because you're employing them whereas you know if you're getting advice free on the internet you have to ask who's paying for that advice it's often advertising it's sponsorship and sometimes it can be an outright fraud that's paying for it and therefore the advice you're getting is going to end up costing you a lot of money mm -hmm. um, on the issue of young people and debt um, you know, kids leaving university now with just starting out in life with debt, just as a matter of fact. Um, I was talking to my oldest, who's le leaving university and talking about trying to get into that savings habit, and she's just like, I I I'm not going to be in a position where I can yeah. think of that. And, you know, trying to give that message, which, um, you know, the, I've been doing these conversations, I've been learning from these conversations myself, and that sort of message that, you know, even small amounts just to get into the habit are worth it. But that mindset of how much debt people are just kind of getting used to and you know it's, it, savings seem like a drop in the ocean mm. in com by comparison to it w what would your advice be I, I completely empathize because I am in a position of paying um, you know a high interest rate on my student debts and mm -hmm. thinking about whether I ought to try and, and, and pay those off again you know weighing up the interest rate on those versus um, what you could earn on your you know savings but also then uh, what your what interest rate you're paying on other debts that's all part of the assessment that, that you have to do now and interest rates have gone up on on student debts in recent times so so it has become a much more live issue than it used to be mm -hmm. when we talked about student debt really being a, a tax that people could you know maybe be uh, not not it's not a case that they they wouldn't necessarily need to worry about it insofar as it was taken off their paye salary and so on but but in a way, you know, it was something that they just needed to let it run. Now, if the interest rate is high enough, then perhaps it's worth considering whether um, paying that off might be a good idea if you have the ability to within your family. Sometimes parents can help with that and so on. Again, it's about trying to figure out what your resources are, whether there's any kind of intergenerational family cooperation and planning that can go on. And again, an advisor can really help um, you understand what your options are. I think there's an added point there, which is mm -hmm. a lot of the time families think of, of inheritance or of, of wealth moving through the generations mm -hmm. that happens on death. But actually, a lot of the time, people's requirement for money happens when they are younger. Mm -hmm. you know, if if a, a typical person passes away when they're late 80s, early 90s, their kids are probably in their 60s, mm -hmm. um, actually the peak expenditure time is probably very late 20s to mm -hmm. very late 30s. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be exactly that. And, and it comes back to what we were saying about the decisions you make in a 5% plus interest rate world, and student loans are, are a law unto themselves, mm -hmm. um, versus a 1% world are very different. So an advisor can help just open that debate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just doesn't even occur to them to make gifts in lifetime. Mm -hmm. But also it's, it's the what you don't know is actually, do you know there's some tax implications of doing this? Mm -hmm. You can be more helpful now than waiting 30 years into the future. And it's having that sort of independent third party to open that debate rather than just the kids asking for money, which is the, yeah. the sort of temptation of what it may look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, question from the audience, I think for you, Lewis, uh, which is about um, pensions, you were saying about 
final salary pensions kind of not being so prevalent anymore. Would you recommend a private pension plan for someone self-employed or is an investment portfolio sufficient? A lot of that is going to come down to tax advice. Um, so especially being self-employed, potentially being a business owner, there's probably a broader discussion there about whether self-employed is right or an employee of an incorporated business and that changes the kind of pension decisions you make. Um, so I would talk to uh, an accountant and a financial advisor um, to see, it comes back to the point about being efficient. Yeah. What's the most efficient way of essentially extracting money from a trade or a business and putting it into, into a pension? Uh, and, and tax will be the answer to that. We're just about ready to, to wrap up. So I just wondered if you could both kind of summarise um, the most practical and best tips that you can for, for people watching. Do, do you want to go first, Iona? There, there's so much that we could say um, about, about this whole subject. I, I think that it, it's so important to actively engage with what the future could look like. Um, it's extremely scary thinking about that, the things that we do know will happen, such as us getting older and, and, and dying. But also, we've seen in recent years, the unknown unknowns can also be you know, pretty mind-blowing. I think that if we try to think about ways to keep our options open for the future, however hard that might seem in the here and now, however limited and restricted our options might seem right now, actually, starting to understand what's going on with your finances and then getting expert advice or finding out the information you need to find out about what solutions are available, that could give you so much peace of mind in knowing that actually things might not be as bad as they seem right now at this moment in time mm -hmm. and that actually you know, there may be options for you. So, and, and I think that when it comes to something like investing and saving for the future, in my book, Owner, I talk about investing being an act of practical hope. And I think right now, that's what we need. We need more hope. Mm. And it can be very difficult to have that, yeah. especially when the outlook is so uncertain. But doing something like saving and investing for the future, it's you having hope for the future and you saying, actually, this is going to happen and I'm going to try and be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And if you're worried about the unknowns by actually sort of making yourself look at it and start to address it, at least you know, hopefully things won't get worse. That's the moment when things can start to change and improve. And knowing that, that you will cope that you will manage, that, that you know, even if things will not be as optimal or as ideal as, as you'd like them to be, that you will still have that mental as well as financial resilience to be able to cope with them. Mm -hmm. Look at you know, us during lockdown, I think as a society overall, we, all, we cope pretty well with it actually. And we, as individuals, found our own resilience during that time that maybe we didn't realise we had. True. So for me, I think there's one, um, one point around making the complex simple. Mm -hmm. And everyone is slightly different, but one thing that I've seen work very, very well is to write things down. Mm -hmm. So you take all of your problems and concerns and then you can get your short list. Comes back to my, my same point about keeping things simple. What is it that I'm worried about that I can change, that I can influence? A lot of the things we worry about, we can't change. Whether you worry about them or not, it still will or won't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so getting yourself a, a short list of, of the tangible things you can do is very, very useful. Um, so that would be my, my number one. Secondly, it comes down to the conversation point. Yeah, we're all in this world at the same time. There are a lot of people that have a lot of similar kind of concerns. So in your family unit, amongst friends, whatever it may be, just having that conversation, it can be very easy to sort of get lost in your own head. Mm -hmm. Actually, when you talk to your peers, family, whatever it may be, that can be quite a relief, quite a weight off mm -hmm. um, of shoulders. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then thirdly is make it a habit. That's it. it may seem like you know, sometimes investing is like watching paint dry. You know, mm -hmm. It goes up a bit, down a bit, and, yeah. and that can be soul destroying. And, and I look at these things every day, it can be soul destroying. Mm -hmm. But it works, just keep going and it works. Mm -hmm. And it will be the point at which you're just about to give up on it, that's when it will start to work. Mm -hmm. And if it's become a habit, you won't ever get to that point of giving up it will just work over time thank you both so much it's been great to talk to you as i said i've been learning from these conversations and i've certainly learned a lot from both of you today and i hope uh, people at home have as well so thank you it's been Pleasure. great to talk to you and of course thank you as always for joining us uh, for these conversations i really do hope you've enjoyed them as much as as i have if you've missed any of the conversations or you want to refresh yourself 
on any that we've had previously. They're all available via the Charles Stanley website, charles-stanley.co.uk. Uh, you'll also see, I hope, about now a QR code on your screen. And if you click on that, it'll take you to the Charles Stanley Financial Guide. And from there, you can also uh, access the chats as well. But for now, it's been great being able to be with you. I hope you have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.